Well, hello, everybody. Um, I believe I am now live. I'll close this and I'll see if I have a sign that shows that I'm on. So anyway, if, if, there is, if, if people are seeing this, please uh, make a comment in the chat. Uh, but what I will do is, um, well, let me tell you uh, a couple things. I'm going to, there's a 90 minute session, which is quite long. I'm going to try to make the most of it by leaving some time for Q&A at the end. Oh, great. Someone just te- uh, added to the chat that I'm out live. So I'll, I will proceed. Um, and, you know, the chat is for you folks to communicate with each other. Um, thank you. I see the, the comments coming up. Uh, hi, Ken. Hello, hello, Joe. Good to see you. Um, Barnard, your, uh, your project is incredibly inspirational. Um, I'm a big fan of reusable rockets and propulsive landing. In any case, um, Chat's going to be for you to speak to each other when I'm speaking, because I'm not going to be able to pay attention to that as I go through the slides. But at the end, I'm hoping to leave time for Q&A. And you'll notice there's a Q&A tab on the right as well. So if you actually have a question you want me to address at the end, feel free to put that there. But, you know, hold, hold it until you actually have a question, uh, presumably not yet. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll try to address as many as I can. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is really my favorite subject matter, uh, things that are all loosely interrelated, but I'm deeply passionate about. It started with sport rocketry. I'll tell just a brief background of my personal uh, intersection with NAR and uh, how it's been so deeply inspirational to me. I will transition to uh, the business applications I've found. I, I'm, I, I'm a venture capitalist for those who don't know, so I invest in startup companies. And that has included um, you know, the earliest rounds at Planet, and SpaceX, where I joined the board of both companies um, sort of early on, <clears throat> over a decade now. And um, I've learned a lot from, you know, what I would argue are the sort of leaders in, in launch and the small sat revolution uh, in the case of planet Earth observation. And I'll try to share some of the lessons learned. It, it'll, it might morph into what might feel a little bit more like a general business slash technology uh, overview, hopefully still of interest to people who have a passion for rocketry. It's just bigger rockets and uh, interesting, brave new worlds that we're exploring. And I think at, at some level, I would hope everyone in the audience is excited about the possibility of colonizing Mars, of, you know, revitalizing the uh, space program, uh, both in the U.S. and abroad, and uh, and seeing what the future may lie on these frontiers of the unknown, um, both the engineering that makes these things possible, the autonomous flight um, systems and what simulation systems, as well as, of course, uh, the learnings that can occur when humanity expands beyond our, uh, you know, beyond our planet and near Earth orbit um, milieu. So with that, let me, I'm going to switch to full screen. I'll just get the make maximum use of pixels. And uh, I may, I may switch back every once in a while just to see if people are saying something in the chat like uh, we can't hear you. I hope you can hear me. Okay. It sounds like you can. Uh, wait, that didn't work. Let me try one more time. Uh, no, 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 no. Some random page. There we go. Oh, yeah, tear down. That's nice. Let me just try this one more time. There we go. Got it. Okay, here we go. So, where does this start? I'm part of the Livermore unit of the National Association of Rocketry, lunar.org for short. Um, I've been told it's the largest uh, NAR prefecture, but uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that. This was from way back. Um, we I started rocketry when my son was three years old, and I'm the, He's in this picture with, with my daughter as well. Um, but uh, man, this was amazing. There was a time, uh, unfortunately no longer, where we were able to launch at NASA Ames. Uh, that's the big hanger in the background that when he used to have this cover. And um, I helped persuade uh, Pete Warden, uh, the base commander, to let us do that, which is crazy because there'd be like, you know, military planes scrambling. Literally, these rockets under shoot would land on the wings of like F-18 Hornets. And there was a Zeppelin that came and went. Um, and believe it or not, we were launching rockets throughout, which is amazing. So um, I started again in 2003 when my son was three. Two years later, we were in the Black Rock Desert, XPRS. And oh, my God. I mean, it, it still quickens my pulse to see this particular rocket. And the owner there listening to the uh, flight computers. I did not know this was possible, right? Up until this first trip to the desert, I'd only seen rockets that, you know, you know, SDs and below. Um, never had launched an aerotech engine at that point. And, I, and here's the interesting detail. So I was there with my son, five years old. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to get my level one cert because I want to launch some of these things. But I said, there is no way I'm ever going to get my level three cert. That is insane. The the work, you know, take the test. I had this sort of heard the folklore of what you have to do to get your level three. And seeing this project, I'm like, there's no way on God's green earth I'm ever going to be doing anything like that. So you can rest assured. I'm like, don't worry, son. You know, what you see around you is for, you know, spectator use only. Well, two years later, uh, these are some projects. I got into the V2 kick for a while. Um, and uh, got on the cover of Sports Rocketry a couple of times. That bigger one, top center, 
uh, my son could fit in during the build, um, uh, never, of course, during the launch. And it had like three literally like the gold brick equivalents of lead in the nose for nose weight, because as anyone knows, um, you know, your CP over CG ratio, uh, you need on a V2 design to have a lot of nose weight. And uh, some of you might know that in the U.S., when we imported a bunch of V2s from uh, Germany after the war and, and launched one from White Sands without a warhead, it spiraled out of control. This guy from Theo Cole told me this, uh, or I, excuse me, United you know, Technologies told me this. It was spiraled out of control, burned off enough nose weight, let me see fuel weight, what am I saying? Pulled off enough fuel weight to suddenly go straight, and it went into and took out a cemetery in Mexico. Um, that you know, many people probably seen in lesser flights. Uh, it was kind of a mind blowing one. My son designed that bottom center photo, which of course is a really bad idea on many levels to have a motor at each fin tip. But we managed uh, through a variety of techniques to pull that off after learning a few ways not to do it properly. And, and, it, and it makes for an incredible flight. Uh, largest project I did was an O motor. Um, and uh, this was incredible. I had this speaking Kate GPS system, several onboard uh, cameras and uh, sort of is still perhaps a pinnacle of launch for me. I, I like big, incredible spectacles, big plumes of fire. Uh, I haven't gone for altitude per se as much as just does it look good for the photos that I take uh, at launch, <laughs> to be honest. Okay, so where did this passion come from? Well, like some, you know, I was a young uh, budding geek at, uh, as a child. I really had fashion down. I mean, notice the matching three stripes on the shirt and the socks on the right. Um, and, and I lived not too far from Johnson Space Center where I had a week-long camp once, and I met actually a guy there who went by the name Lord British. And then 30 years later, so first met him at Johnson Space Center, 30 years later, after giving a talk at NASA Ames, I'm like, wait a minute, he's got the same necklace that I remember that he never took off. And I was like, wait, are you Lord British? He had introduced himself to Richard Gary at the astronaut, you know, who'd, uh, it, you know, gone to the space station as a civilian. And, uh, and anyway, so this was a memory from that time. This was about the time that I met him, got enamored with computer science and Apple II programming and really had a diversion for a long time before I got back to space. Uh, but we'll come back to that in a moment. So uh, of late, uh, in like the last 20 years, I've done a variety of things. I had the great honor of being able to do the photo shoot uh, in, of the entire interior of Space Shuttle Endeavor be, uh, on the last day of its power up. So you notice all in the top left corner, all the displays are live. They drain the fluid and that will, it will never be able to be powered up again. And that is the um, immersive display at the CSE at California Science Center down in LA where it's on permanent display where you can actually, you know, as a, as a visitor to the museum, you can see the orbiter, but you can actually, to get any sense of what's inside, it's it's my photos stitched together into a three-dimensional uh, walk-through, fly-through kind of exhibit, which is kind of cool. Um, I've done the zero gravity flights a few times. I love that, highly recommend them. I think that plus high altitude balloons are more interesting than some of our little flights that are coming up, but I'll say more about that later. Um, XPRIZE has been really inspirational over the years. I actually, Amazingly, went on a submarine ride with Scott Perzinski, uh, an ISS astronaut who uh, told me all about CO2 scrubbers, which are relevant in both. Um, some early visits to Moon Express. Um, oh, there's Neil Armstrong in the bottom right corner. And I, in my early naivete, uh, brought Tang for the photo shoot. And he's like, that's a farce. We never used it. Um, you know, shame on me. But I did get to talk with him a bit about his, uh, his dreams of Apollo and his greatest nightmares leading up to launch. Then I started collecting space artifacts. This was maybe starting 12 years ago. It has gone completely out of control. I've converted the entire office into a museum of space artifacts. This includes a full RL-10 engine, a lunar module descent engine, um, docking hatch, uh, fuel cell, early one for, on the bottom right from, uh, you know, from the Apollo program, one of the, one of the earliest ones used in the ground simulation systems. Uh, and uh, along the way, I got to know a bunch of the astronauts. So I personally gathered all these signatures from the Apollo astronauts as a tribute for SpaceX. It hangs in uh, headquarters on the way to the you know, sort of front door on the way to the main um, engineering and manufacturing facilities. And this was right after the first successful uh, docking with the space section. And so the, the SpaceX had just entered the news. And the reason I did this was to specifically get Gene Cernan bottom right to sign something uh, in response to a 60 Minutes interview he did where he seemed very derisive of commercial space. And I first got you know all the other Apollo astronauts to sign, then approached Gene, had a chance to finally explain the history of SpaceX and Elon's incredible role in getting started. And it sounded like he warmed up quite a bit to SpaceX after that. So I was very, very excited about that. And it's my favorite artifact. Um, I've also got some big things like ground control systems that were used in Apollo and in the movie Apollo 13. I've uh, collected things that were used in training, but just are very evocative of the period, like an entire Apollo couch. I've now added all the joysticks. I've collected them separately uh, that attach to those little flip up armrest things. Um, so, you know, the, the, the translational controls and uh, flight control uh, units for each one. Armstrong's glove used in training. 
Um, and things that flew, uh, for example, the first Hasselblad in flight, or at least there's some debate as to which was the first. This is the one that Wally Shira owned and strongly believed was first. Gordy Cooper thinks his was first, and there's actually an argument that Gordy might have been first and this might have been second. Most, my, maybe my favorite artifact is this particular um, wrist instruction set, sort of this cuff checklist that's called, that's literally on John Young's hand as he's doing that jump salute shot, the famous shot, shot on the left. And each of these pages flips over, they're plasticized pages. And this is, but it also shows you, like at the time, this was the state of the art of, you know, printing, uh, you know, basically typewriters and drawings for how to take soil samples and stuff on, on, on a mission. Um, the last thing I'll say before switching to some other topics is uh, my favorite part of the collection as an assemblage is I have a part of every lunar module that's been to the moon. So let me repeat that. Literally a registered part of the spacecraft that was on the moon, and in every case, it was meant to be left behind when the lunar module jettisons and the command module for the last time. It either crashes in the moon or goes into an orbit that will never be seen again. Um, and so all this material is meant to be lost forever, but in every single case, uh, an astronaut brought back souvenirs contrary to protocol and smuggled them home and were allowed to keep them. Finally, by an act of Congress, uh, legally, without question, allowed to keep them. And this includes the armrest in the bottom right corner from Apollo 17, a small data clip in the middle from Apollo 11, and my very first artifact I collected, which was this um, crewman's optical alignment site on the bottom left corner that John Young used in Apollo 16. It's essential for docking. That that 45 degree glass is effectively an analog heads up display of a reticle, and without it, you can't dock the lunar module to the command module. And uh, so it's sort of mission critical was part of the lunar module, and he brought it back. Lastly, um, I've started only with lunar meteorites, but then I've got a few extras. I figured owning a piece of the moon, a piece of Mars, the largest slice of the moon on Earth, um, on the left, bigger than any rock back, back by the Apollo program. It's gorgeous, it's sort of just beautiful to watch. And, and then a uh, you know, piece of Mars on the right. If anyone wants a Q&A, I can describe how we know for sure that these came from those places. They came as meteorites, right? It's, it's illegal to own Apollo stones, of course. But uh, um, but there you have it. Let me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna end the show for one second. Just double check. There's nothing weird happening. Uh oh. Let me make sure. Okay. No, this looks good. Okay. So no one's complaining that the sound is bad. I'm gonna go back and full screen. So, let me shift uh, as a transition to some business topics. So I. The only time I've ever written an article in Harvard Business Review was uh, this one on the left, launching a better brain. And I was making the argument that uh, one way to stave off. Uh, basically diseases of aging is to maintain cognitive plasticity by doing new things and challenging yourself the way a child would to, in a sense, uh, nurture a childlike mind. I gave a TED talk around the same time um, about the model rocketry and about 2007. And you can find it online if you, if you want to see it. And, uh, and I really did believe that uh, both my kids as inspiration and the things we did together, like rediscovering rocketry as a hobby, um, have kept me young at heart, if you will, and I believe will help with you know sort of cognitive sharpness as as I age. I'm like 53 years old and um, and I'm not getting any younger. And uh, yet I just love acting like a child. <laughs> so um, the work I do though, interestingly, as a venture capitalist, uh, we try to invest in big ideas with you know passionate entrepreneurs that are going to change the world for the better. And we also try to invest in things that are unlike anything we've seen before. Okay, fair enough. Um, and given everything I just said and just showed you about my passion for rocketry as a hobby, collecting Apollo artifacts, collecting meteorites. You might think, wow, he should be, as a venture capitalist, all over the space sector. And for 10 years or longer, there wasn't a single business plan I ever saw from any space startup that made what I thought to be enough business sense, meaning the amount of money required was reasonable, the time frame of development was reasonable, you didn't depend on the government or someone else giving you a piece of business in the future that you didn't have. Uh, like a contract or what have you. Um, so for 10 years, not a single proposal rose above my hurdle to say, let me at least introduce it to my partners. Let me let me, let me show the rest of my team what I found that I think might be an interesting space investment. So like not only did we not invest in anything, I didn't think anything passed the muster to even share with anyone else at work until SpaceX and everything changed. So again, we invested for the first time early 2009. I've been on the, 2000, yeah, 2009. I've been on the board for 11 years now and um, it changed everything. Um, first off, uh, you know, lower the cost of access to space. We'll come back to that later when we, when we talk about planet. Uh, but it also inspired a, a whole bunch of other venture capitalists to come uh, later on. This, this really is a 2015 onward period when 
it became public that SpaceX had raised you know, over a billion dollars from Google and Fidelity. Um, and subsequent, the amount of investment in the venture, in, uh, venture investment in space just has exploded to multiple billions per year. In fact, in that one year, 2015, SpaceX raised a billion, Planet raised 100 million, the two largest rounds of the year. Those two alone exceeded all prior years of venture investment in space startups combined times two. Of time through 2014, add it all up, multiply by two, that was 1.1 billion. Uh, and it's been multiple billions since. Uh, there have been 145, actually 150 small sat launch companies funded, uh, which is kind of amazing, um, and a whole bunch of other stuff too. And in fact, 500 different venture firms have now invested in space startups. <laughs> there were like five uh, when we invested in SpaceX. Um, and I call it the SpaceX magic, and I'm going to try to make the argument for why is it that SpaceX has been able to do what it has done? Why is it that they've been able to do it so many times right the first time, right? Like it usually took many failed trial and error experimentations to get something like a new rocket engine design or a new airframe to fly well. Um, any of us in rocketry know if you didn't have Roxim, you know, like what? What would be the chances that something randomly from scratch works perfectly the first time if it's pushing the envelope, right? if it's you know, pushing the frontier of what's possible? Um, and, and I'll make the argument a lot of it has to do with software and simulation. And as a setup for that, let me show this slide. I show it in every presentation I give, regardless of subject matter. I think it's the most important thing ever graphed, bar none. And in q and I'd love it if someone could say, hey, you know, there's something else that you might want to consider is more important. And, and by importance, I mean, <laughs> it really begs a lot of questions. It predicts the future. It is the underbelly of why technology accelerates, why venture capital exists as a field, why entrepreneurship is possible in technology uh, in many cases. I mean, not always, but usually it has to do with something uh, becoming possible now computationally that wasn't possible before. So let me, let me explain the graph. Um, it's a logarithmic graph. So on the left side, you'll notice that every tick mark is 100x, 100x, 100x. And what we're plotting is basically how much calculations, you know, computational power, calculations per second you can buy for a buck. Um, and it's a constant dollar meaning inflation adjusted. So what we're basically saying is, okay, people don't buy transistors, uh, even though Gordon Moore, uh, d you know, was in his 1965 paper was talking about, you know, fab yield optimization from a manufacturing engineering point of view for, you know, a, uh, you know, a silicon wafer fab. What he was seeing was a refraction of a longer term trend that had nothing to do with Intel, had nothing to do with integrated circuits or silicon. Right, because each of these cut bands of gray, are, you'll notice at the top they're labeled. They're different technologies they have nothing to do with each other. Mechanical, you know, device that took the census in 1890, the relay-based machine that, if you saw the movie Imitation Game, cracked the Nazi Enigma code in World War II, the vacuum tube computer that predicted Eisenhower's win in '56. You know, they have nothing to do with this sort of microcosm, as Gilder called it, of the integrated circuit that we sort of assumed is the faster, better, cheaper. That every year computers seem to be twice as fast for the same cost. Well, isn't it weird that this curve goes back 120 years, back when no one knew they were even on a curve, before anyone thought to plot it? Again, it wasn't until like 1965 that anyone started plotting this, and then much later when Ray Kurzweil first put this in his book, Ages of Virtual Machines, that he had put the dots together, and so did um, one other guy. Um, uh, there was another roboticist who made a similar analysis. Uh, and, by, and by the way, as a reminder, a straight line is an exponential on this graph, right? This is a slightly upticking line. So. First off, Intel is not the latest 10 data points, that's NVIDIA. And I would argue that from 2020 onwards, they're going to be dedicated silicon solutions for machine learning and deep learning that are going to take the price and take the baton even further um, because they can outperform the NVIDIA GPUs by another 10x or 100x in many cases. Um, and in some cases, they're using analog compute. There's also quantum computing. There's a lot going on to continue this curve. The reason I belabor it is A, what happens when you reach a certain threshold is something that was not simulatable becomes simulatable. So for example, here at NASA Ames, we have all these wind tunnels that were used for aircraft design. You build a physical model of something, testing a winglet or a whatever it might be, and then you blow air, or air over it and see how efficient it is. Calculate a coefficient of drag or what have you. See where there are vortices in a mechanical system. Well, obviously, when you know, computer-aided design tools and, uh, and computational fluid dynamics got good enough, you don't need to use those wind tunnels. They largely lie fallow, except for some hypersonic Mars you know, parachute testing and things occasionally. Um, but basically, aircraft design, starting with the 777 onward, has not required any physical wind tunnel tests of any sort. Just like you, you know you'll likely pass your first crash test as a car company these days. Um, you don't really need to sacrifice a lot of crash test dummies 
uh, but for your you know final certification because you can run simulation over simulation, make sure that your systems are safe. You can test, of course, coefficient of drag, things of that sort. Um, and in in, in 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 summary, things that were trial and error experimentation sciences become simulation sciences. The pace of progress accelerates dramatically. The rate at which you can run experiments goes up hundredfold or a thousandfold, and things might work the first time because you tested them in a computer like a billion times before first flight, like the first human flights with the SpaceX DM2 mission. Um, and that's essentially, I believe, the story of many different technology markets and why they're interesting, like why life sciences and biotech is going through revolution, why early on computing, then datacom and telecom, and now agriculture and all kinds of, well, actually, I'll show a slide, all kinds of unusual industries that you wouldn't think is software centric or is data centric. Well, some you might, but not all of them, um, like automotive, you know, 10 years ago, aerospace 10 years ago, people wouldn't have thought of them as software centric businesses. And by that software centric, I mean that the physical thing is a vessel for code. The reason someone buys your product over another product is the software. Now you can see this more understandably, I think with cars. Once you're trusting the car to be your fully autonomous driver, that's super important. That suddenly becomes more important than almost any other feature of the car. And you would never buy one that is noticeably worse in its safety rating for autonomous driving. It becomes the singular feature for which you would choose one car over another. They're all gonna be electric, of course. It's just a question of, well, what, does this one look nice? Does this, does this one have longer range? Well, that's important, but I think the software stack will be the most important part. It'll be the only, decision, or it'll be the dominant by far decisions I have for consumers 10 years from now, let's say, you know, when all the vehicles are autonomous and all the vehicles are electric. Um, everything SpaceX makes is an autonomous vehicle. The booster, the upper stage, the boat, the fairing that comes back, um, they're all autonomous vehicles. Uh, the software stack is what makes it possible to do propulsive landing. Uh, that magical thing we'll say a little bit more about, of course. Um, and it really makes the product different from all the others that are on there and the ones that came before. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you guys have seen this, I'm sure. I chose these two pictures because they're just amazing milestones. You know, first human flight with SpaceX and the two side boosters of the Falcon Heavy coming back like in synchrony the way you see it in simulations that like it, it defies belief that that's real. Um, I was there for the, that, actually both those launches live uh, and saw them at the Cape and it just takes your breath away. Now, how is it SpaceX was able to do these things and have them work the first time, right? Remember there was like 8 billion hours of simulation testing of the DM2 mission before flight. Well, it, it's simulation. On the left, you can see what was affectionately called the Iron Maiden at, uh, at SpaceX. This was an early on photo. What they have is the entire avionics stack laid out like Frankenstein, where it doesn't know it's not in space. It's a rocket and it's kind of like in the matrix, all of its sensory inputs are fed from a computer that can basically simulate things, one inch out, two inches out, incredible crosswinds, whatever it might be, um, and test all the different scenarios, right? And so, of course, they do that for all the flights, uh, you know, all the new aircraft, excuse me, all the new um, uh, design iterations of, of the product. On the right, you have some of the interesting uh, software stack that SpaceX wrote from scratch, a wavelet compression uh, uh, algorithm for predicting combustion instability. Something people might remember in the Apollo program was a real devil for the F1 engine. Um, and it's kind of interesting that you would build, develop your own software stack from scratch as opposed to use something off the shelf just because how it shows you how important that simulation element is for what they're doing. Uh, the net effect is incredibly low cost to orbit. This is the GTO, um, as some of you may have seen last Sunday when they launched 143 satellites in a single go. Uh, the incremental cost there was $5,000 per kilogram to orbit. And I might point out, not only here do you see all these other you know, mainstream competitors on pricing, but you have, as I mentioned, 150 other new entrants trying to do small sat launch as their focused area of business, usually at costs um, per kilogram that are at least 2x and in some cases 12x, even higher still, um, like, like in the case of Virgin Orbit, um, much, much higher uh, still uh, per kilogram. And, and it's not entirely clear why you do that when you could you know, fly with Falcon 9 and then take some other kick stage from Momentus or any number of other companies that are developing them to get to the orbit you want at again, much lower cost than a standalone launcher. Here's an interesting graph. Don't, don't worry about the colors that aren't blue. Just focus if you, uh, for a moment on the darkest blue bottom bars. That's US market share of commercial launch. Notice that in 1980, it was 100%. So 100% of you know cable television satellites, communication satellites, you know the Sirius XM equivalents, whatever. If someone's launching satellites, they flew on a US rocket. Notice that for three years, 2010 to 2012, the number was 0%. 
In other words, U.S. companies, European companies, you name it, never chose a U.S. launch vehicle. There was nothing competitive with basically all the other countries you see on the, on the legend on the right. Kind of damning. Could it go 100% market share to zero? And this, this is the free market, right? So the only reason there were U.S. launch companies in business at all was the government, right? Where you're beholden to launch on your own rockets. You don't like, like the U.S.'s military isn't going to launch on a Chinese or Russian rocket, for example. It's not the consideration set. So, you know, but for that, they wouldn't be in business. There would be zero launch. I mean, zero, right? Think about that. Like, nobody wants what you're offering. Your price is terrible. Um, then, enter, you know, SpaceX enters. Notice the dramatic changes. Um, it's just incredible, right? So I don't know that I've ever seen market share shifts like this in any business that people might consider, quote, mature or big or industrial. You just don't see stuff like this. Now, uh, one of the things that's made this possible is reusability. And I love this quote. I'll just read it out loud. Escaping from Earth will not always be astronomical exp astronomically expensive. This will come through the development of reusable boosters, which can be flown for hundreds of missions like normal aircraft. Now, I read this, this opening by Sir Arthur Clarke in a uh, Virgin uh, Galactic um, uh, booklet. Uh, actually, it was about Spaceship One, excuse me, Spaceship One booklet. And uh, I'm like, wow, that sounds a lot like Elon Musk. Like, isn't that word for word what he said? You know, like airplanes and reusability and boosters and, the, and this imperative. I'm like, wow, that's kind of weird that he doesn't, that this, I'd read that far. What's astounding is the very next line that I don't, that I don't show here. Um, where, where Sir Arthur Clarke says, when I said this, this is his quoting himself, <laughs> in 1969, Apollo 11 was on its way to the moon. So Sir Arthur Clarke said this in 1969. And he goes on to say, it's like unbelievable how the entire U.S. space industry got distracted with the first Vietnam War and then the space shuttle and that sort of Frankenstein, um, that we lost the sort of obvious trajectory for making us a spacefaring species the way, of course, Sir Arthur Clarke would have wanted us. Um, on the left, by the way, is a photo I took um, in Texas of what was called the Grasshopper launch vehicle, single engine. Later, they had a three engine, uh, one called the F-9R, uh, which was amazing uh, before it blew up. Um, and you can see a person there for scale. It, uh, you know, it just gives you a reminder of like the kind of physical prototyping that was done early on to test the software algorithms on propulsive, you know, takeoff and landing. And then, of course, it just becomes glorious. It's just amazing, right? The, the, there are many, fli many flights of these more incredible photos than you can imagine. And, and the one on the right is the one that that's now greets everyone you know, at SpaceX headquarters. Uh, now, as many of you know, SpaceX has put a lot of effort into obsoleting its entire product line. Uh, meaning when this thing you see here, these are the Raptor engines inside one of the, uh, the Starship test vehicles. Um, when this starts flying, all the other ones will be retired in the same way that the Falcon 1 was retired when the Falcon 9 started flying. Because again, cost per kilogram on the Falcon 9 is so much better than a small sat launch vehicle like the Falcon 1 that they just canceled the Falcon 1. And Elon is literally, and just think about this, they're just going to stop with everything that you currently know in terms of Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, et cetera. Uh, because this is so much better. It uses methane um, as a fuel instead of kerosene. And the big design effort to design a new engine that uses methane was motivated by the desire to get back from Mars, to reuse the launch vehicle uh, from Mars. And you're, we're assuming that when you drill down for oil on Mars, you're not going to find it, right? Like this uh, equivalent of what the dinosaurs, as we call it, but really it was algae mats that, you know, fossil, you know that, that became oil and gas and the uh, petrochemical economy we rely on on Earth. Uh, the, we're not going to find that on Mars, but we can make methane quite easily with a variety of processes, the body A process and others from, you know, simply um, uh, CO2 and water um, and uh, we can make CH4 and that will be the rocket fuel. Then it turns out, oh, lo and behold, frack natural gas is the lowest cost hydrocarbon, the cleanest burning, uh, most efficient um, for this particular use case um, as a bonus, which is just kind of amazing how many times things like reusable flight which, by the way, if you get to Mars, you have to reuse the rocket. You don't just fly it one way. Like, how are you going to get back? So this whole concept of reusability was motivated by Mars. So was the switch, switch, switch to methane. And, of course, just the larger, incredibly large, unprecedentedly big um, uh, Starship design that's underway. So this is a segue to ask the question, why only SpaceX has done any of these things? Reusability, this uh, this thing you see here, why put billions of dollars of effort into something that none of the other incumbents were doing when SpaceX started? So again, roll the clock back 10 years, none of the existing rocket companies uh, at the time in the U.S. or elsewhere paid any attention to this. They thought it would never work, especially reusability. And one of the reasons is they were just living large off the government contracts, right? There wasn't something driving them to do more. Because if all you're doing is lofting satellites to the government at incredibly bloated prices, that's a really easy life. And this took a lot of work. And what motivated this was the dreams of Mars. 
um, having a passionate, visionary goal that transcends sort of the everyday here and now is incredibly powerful. Right. At Tesla, where I was on the board for over a decade, I saw it also, you know, Elon's other company that, you know, tra- leading and catalyzing the transition of all vehicles to be electric motivates the employees like crazy. It motivates customers and partners and government agencies that work with Tesla. It's one of the keys to their success is to be doing something that people applaud, that if they succeed in their mission, the world will be a dramatically better place. And making humanity a multi-planetary species is up there. It's a, you think about like the greatest hits of evolution, like the, the opposable thumb, thumb, the neocortex. This will probably be one of those greatest hits literally for what future species post-humanity might call, uh, you know, call the, the seminal moments of our evolutionary arc, uh, where humanity is, is but, you know, one part of that arc. And part of the way folks are reminded in the bottom center, you see a photo of, uh, Mars and Mars terraform. This literally is just to the left of the front, the front door is to the right. If you hang a right turn, it's right there. So everyone coming and going, uh, the SpaceX headquarters sees this, that Mars thing has been up there for a long time. Terraform version came later. It reminds people of why we're doing what we're doing at SpaceX. Uh, and the bottom right, I love it. That's Buzz Aldrin for people who don't recognize him, but uh, he's he's been an evangelist as well. Okay, so you lower the cost of launch. The main thing here, don't worry about the colors uh, that make up the bars. The main point is satellites that are launched by year went up 5X in five years. So SpaceX enters the scene, notice the 2012. You know, in the first five years, we had a quintupling of the number of satellites launched, right? And some sense of what they are over there. Now, over two thirds of those were planet. We'll get to them in a moment. Um, but there's actually quite a bit going on there in different areas. And so in a, in, in, in a way, we're now transitioning to the satellite side of the business or of the industry. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you lower the cost of access to space, you can have all kinds of entrepreneurial flourishing. I think of an analogy to the internet. Before the fiber build out and all of the ways to access the internet, I mean, all kinds of cable modems, AT&T, you know, now Starlink, we'll get to. Uh, some new generation technologies, you know, lowering the cost of access allowed all of the things that follow, the Amazons, the Ebays, the, you name it, the Googles, and um, and all the cloud enterprise data and business stuff going into the cloud, all that stuff was predicated on access coming down, right? Once you had cheap access, then you can do all these other things. And this is true globally, that each country around the world, whenever the access drops, then all these incredible uh, opportunities and services will become available. So, you know, similarly, similarly to space. It's kind of perhaps an obvious point. Okay, going back to Black Rock Desert and launching. There's a group called Rocket Mavericks um, that did a fairly large launch. Uh, these are each P motors, uh, three of them, uh, staging to another P, and then they had a Q motor equivalent. Um, there was an astrobiology payload flying on it, which you see on the left, meant to sample um, basically very high altitude air. It's never been a shotgun sequence of what, what lives up there. But there was this really, Really weird team that caught my attention from said they were from Google ish and NASA Ames, um, a group of young people there that I met. And uh, they were doing this thing uh, called PhoneSat, they called it, which was uh, a NASA sponsored project out of NASA Ames, I believe, um, to show that a regular Android phone, uh, hence the Google connection, uh, made for a perfectly good satellite. They'd already tested it in a vacuum uh, and you know, all the ground testing they could want to do. Uh, and they just wanted to see if the G-Shock loading of launch would you know, be any problem um, or anything else that might come up in the actual launch in a rocket. So we did that. Uh, this fellow that was on the left were part of the team that pulled that off. Uh, the rocket came back ballistic. You can see what's left of PhoneSat uh, that I saw at a Maker Faire subsequent um, there in that shattered case, but they got the data card out and, and it was a total success for their needs and purposes, which was, can you survive launch? <laughs> in this case, can you survive ballistic reentry? Which they did, uh, and still collect data right up to the end. Um, so a lot of, you know, a lot of G-loading, a lot of, uh, uh, interesting and unplanned testing. So the team, and there's the bottom line, the, the two of the people there, uh, were the founders of Planet. And this literally was a garage startup. I love, there's only been a handful of my entire career that literally start in the garage. Um, and Planet did, which is fantastic. And uh, this was in the early days, and we were, you know, their first seed investor and Series A. This is a model, uh, but it's uh, one-to-one scale of their satellite, so you know, not not a scaled-down model. And as many of you know, this is like a very uh, compared to what was flying at the time, very different. The resolution and quality of what that one on the right takes is just as good as NASA Landsat, arguably a lot better in some cases. The simple way it pulls it off is by flying closer to the subject. So anyone who's done any like photography lenses where you can swap out the lens, you know that you can get a really expensive, heavy, like exponentially expensive telephoto 
or you can get a much cheaper, really dirt cheap lens and take as good a shot or better if you can walk right up to whatever it is you're taking a photo of. So imagine instead of the safari shot of, you know, far away of the giraffe, if you can like walk right up to the giraffe, then you can get a great photo. H- hence planet, planet's inspiration. The other inspiration, frankly, it was, wow, if the cost of launch comes down to a variety of methods, initially it was, but to be fair, ride sharing and, and, various ways to sort of get free rides in quotes, sort of free to the ISS and deployment from there. Uh, that what about disposable satellites? You know, like every year you put a new batch up every couple of years, you know, flying super low. So they'll deorbit natu- naturally. You don't have the space junk risk. And, and per the point, why do this? So you can be closer to your subject, take better photos with smaller telescopes. How about like, you know, an off the shelf telescope that fits in the one U CubeSat uh, diameter, uh, which is what they did off the shelf parts, phone sat project. And in a sense, all of the components of a cell phone, Make for great satellite control. So what do you have? Six axis accelerometer, better than what flew in Apollo by far. Uh, really low cost processor and memory um, and low power because they're in a cell phone. So you got all that work done for you instead of using uh, off the shelf, not, not off the shelf, but like, you know, basically what would be the thing on the left would use, the big satellite would use things that were rad hard, mil spec, things that had been provably flown in space before. Why? Because the satellite's super expensive and you want it the last 10 years. Why? Well, because of course, launch is expensive is the assumption. If you're spending four or five hundred million dollars to get your satellite in orbit, the satellite itself has to be in its whatever its use case is. If, if it's a business satellite, it has to recoup that launch cost plus the cost of the satellite. So the cost of the satellite spirals out of control. About half of its weight uh, is propulsion to keep it in the intended orbit versus the planet Dove could use its uh, solar panels as wings to stay and do a little station keeping, which is kind of interesting, but uh, and may one day add propulsion. But frankly, doesn't need to because the cost of the one on the right is 10,000 times less than the cost of the one on the left. I'll say that again, not 10x, not 100x, 10,000 times cheaper. I've never seen anything like it in business before. And it really speaks to the compounding of like the insanity of using mil spec hardware, where, by the way, if you use a 10 year old chip, 10 years of Moore's law, remember that curve to the 10th power, 1,000x. So if you just use today's chips versus 10 year old chips, you get a thousand X advantage without even being smart about what you're doing. Right. And as a reminder of what that means, the Mars Curiosity rover, the current best and brightest thing driving around Mars has a two megapixel camera, two megapixel. Why is a 2004 design freeze baking in a two megapixel camera? And of course, the comparable processor and memory of that time, which is you know, minuscule. Uh, if, if you use the latest and greatest, uh, you can do a lot more. And that's true for the SpaceX rockets, it's true for Planet Dove. Planet itself has done like new engineering builds every couple months. It's kind of astounding. Of course, new, new software builds every couple weeks, uh, like a software company would, but the physical design uh, has gone through all kinds of iterations, which is the way you do it. So what is Planet an example of? And this is true, I think, for all the small sat companies, uh, is really agile aerospace. In their case, they're revolutionizing how you image the Earth. You know, they fly in, or these things fly in like a string of pearls over the pole so that as the Earth rotates, you raster scan the whole planet. So historically, you'd have a few big expensive satellites and you, like in the movies when they say, we need eyes on Iraq, we need eyes on Afghanistan. What they literally mean is tilting a big ass satellite in space to point at the thing you're gonna take a photo of when it passes over that orbit, which means you're looking at that, you're not looking at both. You gotta pick. Um, and the more spice apps you have, the more things you can pick, but you, you're moving these satellites around all the time to take like an image. It's so much easier to point down all the time, straight down, which is the ideal angle anyway, and just raster scan the planet. And that's what planet does. Uh, monitoring everything on a daily basis, which is kind of astounding when you add it up. Here's the latest, this is as of today. There are, here, there's the parts that I'll just highlight a few things that blow my mind. They collect more earth imagery than all, all other sources, commercial and public combined times 10. They, Rashes down the entire Earth twice effectively every day. And uh, they've like, launched over 450 satellites with 100% success in first contact. Meaning if the satellite, if the rocket hasn't blown up on launch, which has happened with the Antares uh, for them, uh, and I think a rocket lab. So they've lost a rocket lab and lost Antares on launch. But um, actually, I got one of the satellites that survived that explosion, Antares explosion. I have it here in the office uh, over there. Um, so these things are robust. It literally survived this huge explosion fireball at launch. But back to my main point is that uh, they've had 100% success in, in first contact. Again, testament to simulation and, and better, just better design. And it's kind of astounding how much data they downlink. So what can you do with all this? Well, you can take some great photos. To be fair, this is the Skybox technology that they acquired from Google. But you know, when you tilt the thing a little bit, it's like, wow, 
this is hard to imagine these, these images are taken for space. It's also hard to imagine this is real and not a simulation that we live in. Uh, this is in Qatar. Um, this is a fairly recent one, the end of December. And one of the things they can offer is, you know, anywhere on Earth something new happens, like, oh, this, this lava started flowing again after being dormant, or Fukushima, or some other natural disaster where there would be no reason to have satellite imagery of that thing the day before, right? So there is no satellite imagery of Fukushima literally the day before because no one cared. Right? Really old, on average, many, many years old of any given place on Earth. Uh, there, again, planets rash are scanning everywhere. So for first responders and what have you, you can see, okay, what was it before? What was it after? Where, where bridges come or not? Or just simply to monitor something new and interesting like this. Well, it, uh, you know, here's an example that we all may have seen or know of, at least the, the transition. This is uh, cycling through just three images in a loop, uh, by the way. Uh, the, the establishment of this, you know, 200,000 flags uh, on the mall for the inauguration. Um, I'll show you another example from last year. Uh, this is with the near infrared sensors they fly as well. So they have both the RGB band as well as things that can detect vegetation. And that is a spec, and by the way, so red here is a false color, but it's representing, um, vegetation. Basically the chlorophyll, uh, uh, lights up, uh, in the near infrared. And, uh, but it's near infrared. It's not a, a color I can see. So you just map it, let's say, to red. Um, and the reason that's interesting is you can see when something's burned really clearly in the near IR band. And so when you want to track, like, where have the fires burned and what have they done, uh, that's especially helpful. Uh, this is the Gigafactory Berlin. As it's being built, of course, you can track industrial construction. And you can run algorithms like, uh, you know, machine learning algorithms. To do things like, let's count every new uh, new housing start um, globally. Let's count, um, well, I'll show you some examples here, top left, count every tree on planet Earth every day. Turns out, actually, they released this data at some point. Um, there are a lot more trees than anyone thinks. Um, which when people are doing carbon models and stuff, they might want to know that. Um, you know, journalists, analysts, because when you, you, instead of tasking a satellite and then having some analysts look at the data, like in a spy situation, to have, like this was this incredible repository over time, you know, thousand something images for every spot on earth over time. You can do time series, you can run machine learning algorithms, you can look for things. Um, and so let me give you an interesting example. There was a, Journalists at BuzzFeed, of all things, not a particular publication known for investigative journalism, that did what I thought was the most amazing piece of investigative journalism last year. They zoomed in on these prison camps, the known ones, in um, you know the Muslim region of China, which fairly recently the U.S. declared as a genocide zone, um, which is kind of you know very inflammatory language, but definitely an area of interest. And they uh, noticed on Baidu maps in China, right? right Baidu in China. Um, Turns out we were the largest investor in that company, interestingly, um, that the resolution on their maps just whited out at a certain scale. Like in other words, high res was fine. When you zoom into like, let's say the prison camp, uh, the, there's a medium scale that was just, there was nothing, it was blank. And then you zoom in and there was like some old image of up close. And like, well, that's really weird. All of the prison camps we want to look at had this whited out block. Where else are there whited out blocks? And this was the aha. There were a bunch of whited out blocks in areas we didn't know. We didn't know there were prison camps in a bunch of these places. They found hundreds of them by looking at Baidu, where is there a blanked out tile, then going to Planet Labs and getting the real imagery and zooming in and finding barbed wire fences and guard towers. And they look like full on prison facilities. And uh, I forget the colored codes here, but one of these colors are entirely new discovered ones. Others were known ones they verified. Others were abandoned ones. Um, it was pretty pretty damning and hard to, hard to hide, right? You can't really hide from reality uh, when when in space and by space law, we can observe other countries all we want. So this is a uh, image of where I live in San Francisco with uh, red being roads and purple being houses. And it was sort of a simple, very simple machine learning algorithm that, you know, auto labeled everything from satellite imagery from planet. But the scale that you can do this at a planetary level is kind of astounding. Like, let's find every road on Earth every day. And oh boy, do they keep building new ones in India and China that no one knows about for maps. And um, at, at a global level, it's like, wow, the Sahara Desert, there's nothing going on. Most of Russia, there's nothing going on. India, wow, look how dense it is. It's kind of a really interesting way to look at the world that uh, is made possible from the scanning. And the reason I show this is, again, you don't, you don't have humans looking at this torrent of data. You have machine learning algorithms looking for patterns, finding things like finding every new uh, plat, uh, sort of um, pad for uh, a fracking well that's being drilled. So you can track all natural gas fracking activity across the world or U.S. or whatever you want. Or, you know, find me chemical plants that look like this one, um, whatever, right? And you can search the world for that. Uh, so what 
I'm going to leave the Planet Lab story here with this sort of wrap up. So what is it that Planet and a whole bunch of other small tech companies, right? I, the reason I show Planet, just to be fair, is, you know, being on the board there for a decade and knowing the company as well as I do, I can, and also having access to all their latest and greatest stuff, I can show you these things with permission I can't from other startups who are also doing good work. So there's all kinds of great startups in what is this field of agile aerospace or the small set revolution. Um, and a lot of them take advantage of the same things that you just heard from the Planet story, the cheap access to space, Reliance on simulation, commoditized hardware. Again, think of all the iPhone or you know Android phone components. Uh, I, I like this phrase that uh, Chris Anderson of 3D Robotics said that um, basically all these this hardware is the peace dividend of the cell phone wars. That you know when you know, Huawei and Apple are just beating each other up, um, they end up driving the price down ridiculously for these components that we can now use in our satellites and our robots and our cars and all over the place. Um, dematerialization of value. That's just a reminder that you know the thing isn't what it's about. It's a software that drives the thing. Uh, SpaceX rockets have the same FPGA array control boards for all kinds of stuff, um, control uh, control systems throughout the rocket, um, because it's you don't really need uh, computational power beyond a certain amount to do simple things like, you know, have the fairing separate or the pneumatic pressures to put the you know, do stage separation or whatever it might be, um, and might not use the same hardware over and over again. In fact, as many of you, or no, some of you might know, SpaceX has no patents, not a single patent. Um, they know that the software and, and systems engineering and simulation work is not something you need to patent because it's not visible to the outside world. And of course, now, of course, you serve global markets and uh, hence Agile Aerospace. Enough on that. So let's switch to some other satellites, which are, of course, of keen interest. Uh, the stack, you know, I told the engineer who runs this area, I think it's one of the most amazing, in my personal opinion, most amazing engineering feats. I don't know why. Let's say inspirational that shows what you can do when you own and think about the stack of rocket, satellite, satellite optimization with the rocket. And as some of you know, they, they switched from the Tin Tin early designs to these flat pizza box, like there's 60 satellites on that one on the left, right? So there's, if you look left to right, there's actually two satellites, or you can see the, the bound, the, the, the um, I'm pointing at it, but you can't see me, see me point. So, so the ones on the left are one stack, the ones on the right, another stack, 30 on each side. What incredible density of satellites, never been done like this before. And when people saw it deployed, they must have been like, whoa. Because what happens is the upper stage goes through this pirouette. It basically goes through a slow roll. And then they just pop off a couple of bands and they just fling out. And if you think of the angular momentum, each one's slightly different in a rotational moment. They naturally separate from one another without any springs, without any propulsion required. They just separate out like a string of pearls in their orbital plane, like for free. And it's just brilliant. Um, Prior, you'd have like these separate boxes on a central cylinder popping off one at a time, and like that recent Sunday mission, or like the two you see in the center uh, here, those are Planet Lab satellites that are on top of a stack of Starlinks. Um, there's only so many you can stick in there when they're cubes or when they're rectangles, uh, when you're popping them off a cylinder. So, kind of hard to compete with this if you're doing the old method of satellite design. Um, as you know, Starlink is going to be this enormous network. What I get excited about is serving the next 4 billion. So stepping back from the initial markets, because initially you're going to serve all kinds of places in remote areas, um, and then be really valuable for boats and planes and remote oil platforms and all this stuff where they really uh, need uh, better data and connectivity. But there's also the whole humanitarian thing throughout much of Africa and elsewhere, where there are literally 4 billion people who are disconnected from the global economy, who don't have broadband of any sort, and uh, and it's going to be cost effective, right? For not much money, you could light up a whole village, a school, or regions throughout the world. And I think we're going to go, we're going to bring these next 4 billion people onto the internet faster than any forecast currently predicts, because this will be the way to get on, on board. And those people will then be able to be entrepreneurs. They'll be able to have access to online education the same way we do, uh, all the great courses from MIT and elsewhere. And they're just as that they're just as capable and aspirational as anyone else who's not who's currently online and takes it for granted i think that's going to be a flourishing entrepreneurial moment that comes when uh we have egalitarian access around the planet i went uh and hooked up one of these uh panels uh it's really as easy as elon says you plug it in point it at the sky for not to miss it has a motor but that motor is not for tracking it doesn't move in any uh, continuous way it just finds the best single angle given your latitude um, to point, uh, you know, the farther north you are, the, the more of an angle you might want to be on the equator. You obviously might want to point straight up. Um, and, uh, and it also tilt to dump snow or rain off um, over time as well. It was uh, bottom right using, you know, the wildfires up in Washington uh, from humanitarian aid being given to a bunch of 
uh, Native American tribes uh, throughout the U.S. as we speak, uh, and a whole bunch of humanitarian use cases. Okay, other inspirational stuff SpaceX is doing. Oh my God, like four people, really? And two dragons at station at the same time? Next launch is at 420, by the way, uh, April 20th, which I thought was kind of hilarious. Um, and there was also news, as, as you may have seen, that the four people who bought a ticket to the ISS um, so the space tourism market is about to open up. And oh, by the way, this is like a lot easier than it used to be. You don't have to like go and like, you know, little things that pull you back, like astronauts to do or, or do all the kind of crazy training. Or if you wanted to be an astronaut, you know, five years ago, you had to go learn Russian and, and spend quite a bit of time in Star City to fly in Soyuz. There was no other option. Now, you know, you'll have a simple option with modern autopilot. Um, I'm kind of excited uh, for this uh, future of tourism. In contrast, and I mentioned I would refer to this, I'm not the least bit excited about sort of little hops, the go uh, up, come back down. But the main bottom line there is, what will you see? If you're launching out of the New Mexico spaceport, you're going to see a bit of New Mexico. It is, and my, my, my the light bulb went off because of rocketry, right? So I've never gotten to 100,000 feet in the Black Hawk Desert, but I've seen others who have, a whole bunch of teams. The, the Quake rocket comes to mind, and a few others where I saw the video feeds and then the still images, and they look just like these ones at the bottom. Right? It's like you see the desert, you see the you know blackness of space, you see the thin, thin blue line. Deeply inspirational to rocketeers like people on the call, right? I hope everyone on the call has seen some of these videos. They look just like what you see here. It's not what made the astronauts so incredibly excited about being in space. The thing that every ISS astronaut, Apollo astronaut, Gemini, you know, Michael Collins in particular wrote about it beautifully in his autobiography, or his autobiography in, his, in the book that he wrote about space, it's the speed, silently, motionlessly, going at 17,500 miles an hour, circling the entire Earth every 90 minutes, seeing a sunrise or a sunset every 45 minutes. That's what gives you a sense of perspective. It's not seeing New Mexico like we could with our rockets, you know, when we often see Nevada over and over again. It looks just like that image on the right. So I think, bottom line, it's not going to be inspirational the way people imagine when they say, I'm an astronaut, I'm going to space. Like, if you want weightlessness, zero gravity flights are 20 times cheaper, and you can do a lot more of them. If you want to see the views, you'll see more from a balloon. You'll have time to take some photos. It'll be stable. Um, balloon flies lower, but, you know, compared left to right, you still see the blackness of space. But not that different, especially if you, you know, travel for a while. So... I think the bragging rights initially, you know, like my parents come from Estonia, they say I'm the first Estonian to go in space. Yeah, maybe that works for a while, but then after a while, it's going to sound kind of cheesy. It's like saying, hey, I flew first class. Like, okay, so what? <laughs> you flew in an airplane, you flew in a several little hopper. So I don't know, I, maybe I'm being too cynical. Maybe there's something exciting there I'm just missing, but there's n I have no desire to do that. What I want to do is fly around the moon, uh, which I fully intend to do within the next 10 years, um, if not sooner. I'll, I'll probably wait till there's been like 100 flights of others uh, before I go, why be first when you know it gets cheaper and safer the longer you wait? Uh, and I want to go in like a really low orbit, maybe 10,000 feet above low, the highest point uh, and do an EVA. No one's done an EVA uh, around the moon, you know, sort of like Superman flying. Um, no atmosphere, so you can be in orbit really low, kind of like Apollo 10, but a little lower. There are some gravitational mass guns and some other complications where, you know, that might be a bad idea, but um, but there's, there's, you can at least do Apollo 10, you know, 10 orbit, you know, like 48,000 feet or something. Um, but I'd want to push it a little further and make it feel like you're shooting through the, the valleys. I mean, that's a dream. That's cool, right? Um, hop, not so much. We, um, I, I want to mention a couple of things before I end, uh, and then I think I'll have a full half hour for questions, which is great. There's also stuff going in the nonprofit sector, which I find fascinating. So in 2014, we hosted this thing at work uh, called Low Cost Strategies for Lunar Settlement. And we had a bunch of people from NASA, different bases, um, just about every space company we could find that we thought was relevant uh, and a bunch of other people who had been working in one way or another on this theme, different subcomponents like habitats or site selection for like where on the moon should, should we set up a colony. Um, bottom line was let's create an interdisciplinary effort to put a better cost estimate of what it would be if we use modern methods like a SpaceX launch vehicle, not SLS or some crazy overpriced thing. Um, the way other prior budgets might have done. Uh, what if we don't do a bunch of prospecting missions, but we use, like, there were 30, was it 30 years? Is that possible? And it's, I mean, uh, Wingo's work was many years, decades of work, let's just say, um, analyzing all kinds of publicly available data and all kinds of missions for where there's the best, you know, permanent ice, permanent shade, permanent sun, and his, it's like the exact place we'd want to land. Like, let's just go there. And even if we're wrong, it's better than spending much money on, you know, prospecting missions. 
rolling it all up. Let me jump to the punchline. At the time, we concluded it should cost less than $5 billion to create a permanent human presence on the moon, or what you know, Bridenstine and NASA call you know, sustainable presence, meaning economically self-sufficient, boom, not like every year you put $5 billion. It's like you write a check once and you have a moon base in perpetuity. Now, the reason that got so breathtaking, and by the way, we've done some subsequent analysis, we think it's closer to $3 billion. Uh, but let's just say five, uh, put some padding in there. Um, that becomes crazy, as it may sound, within the striking zone of a, a philanthropic project from a single donor. And we even had two, two, two donors that are part of this project that we have specifically in mind, as two people who would probably like to make this their legacy. Now, I'm not sure what extra credibility uh, and analysis it might take to get them to actually write that check, but imagine you could have the Google moon base, the whatever, the Yuri Milner Breakthrough Prize moon base. Um, that's incredible. Uh, and, you know, it's, you know, within the strike zone of, of an increasing number of tech entrepreneurs who care a lot about space. So uh, let me just leave it at that. Um, but most importantly, it doesn't need to cost this much. You fly SpaceX, you do modern methods. Imagine a planet and SpaceX and the engineers with that mentality, not the space shuttle mentality, put the whole program together and design. You can imagine it would cost that much. Another group that I love, or I wanted to say love. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't mention the group. So out of this came a nonprofit called Open Lunar. Um, and uh, Chris Hatfield, the astronaut, is I think, the guy running it. Uh, and we've hosted a bunch of their gatherings at our house um, where they've got all kinds of designs in the works for both projects to show that you can actually do this stuff I was just telling you about, like you know, setting up transponders and relay stations and landing on the moon for inexpensively. Um, do it the scrappy way that Planet Labs would do it, for example, to show that that's possible and have reference designs so that if people want to work on different parts of a problem, there's interoperability. For example, power rail. Is it going to be 60 hertz AC? Is it going to be DC rail? What are we going to breathe? Is it going to be 100% oxygen at 20% pressure or is it going to be normal air like in the ISS? Um, makes a big difference. You can get rid of a whole bunch of airlocks if you standardize on that thing. And that was Hadfield's inspiration. Was like, of course, like what are we going to breathe? Let's answer that question and make sure everyone's on the same page. Okay, B612, coming back to it. Uh, New Earth asteroids, uh, things that could you know, extinguish life on Earth or take out entire cities are a threat. There are a lot of them out there. Um, it turns out, unlike the movies, you don't want to try to blow them up on final approach. That just turns a big ass rock into a bunch of rocks, actually increases the chance of some kind of collision, uh, and it's just silly. What you want to do is detect their orbits years or decades, ideally, before intersecting Earth's orbit and just give them a nudge. Because if you take something that is going to hit Earth 30 years from now and just rear end it. Just hit it hard with something. Um, it will change its delta V that when you integrate over 30 years, we'll have it miss Earth. And like it's that simple. Uh, so early detection, kind of like cancer, is the cure. Um, and so why is it we don't do this? Well, it, it only cost, back when I first uh, donated to B612, it only, and it's, it may sound like a lot, but it's not, $400 million, 400. Uh, you could have this satellite you see on the left in a near Venus orbit looking out so you can see things that are you know, closer to Earth and within the Earth orbit. Um, and within a short order, like a matter of months, detect everything, everything that could possibly harm Earth over the next 50 to arguably 100 years. And why 50 to 100? It's all Moore's law. Basically, the, they use the Google data centers to prove this, that like you can model the free body problems of orbital dynamics going out that far. You couldn't have done this 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You now can, and every year, if compute gets better, you could you could predict farther and farther. So from a simple, sim, you know, single sample set, uh, you could predict these orbits. Now the LSSP, this this huge um, uh, sampling and uh, antenna uh, on uh, or, or telescope rather on Earth is going to try to do some of this. It's not ideal to look through the Earth's atmosphere, and do, it's not ideal to do it from Earth versus from Venus, but um, nevertheless, it's good enough to, to to find a lot, if not the vast majority of threats. So we are going to be able to do this, but it would be great still to fly, and B612 has figured out designs for small sats. Uh, I was urging them to do this, of course. Uh, you know, an array of small sats um, and a bunch of interesting math they've helped push the envelope on to uh, remove noise across a series of samples uh, synthetically. Oh, by the way, let me just show another interesting visual here of how this simulation works. Is, you know, once you gather data, you show in green good outcomes and red, not so good outcomes for how a given Earth uh, asteroid might pass Earth or not. So there's because of the distribution band of probabilities. 
and um, you know, based on nurse rotation and stuff, is what you, you see this, you know, how things end up. That's the kind of computational model you can do at the endpoint. And what's interesting is you get a very accurate band of where it will hit and exactly when it would hit, where sort of in in, in uh, one dimension. Uh, so there's a line there, and and when it will hit. But there's still some statistical variation of like where along that axis it will be. And again, you give it a nudge and it completely moves to the green. Coming back to that image from earlier, I want to point something out as I wrap up. Um, I didn't notice this until I looked more closely at it, that David Scott, Apollo 15 commander, again, remember when this was. This is when SpaceX first had any kind of success doing the cargo missions to the space station, right? He's saying the first leap of many giant steps to Mars. Now, a weird convolution of Neil Armstrong's one giant leap. Um, but I think that was kind of cool that even then the Apollo 11 astronaut commander was seeing in SpaceX the path to Mars. Kind of cool. Buzz Aldrin, of course, has been evangelizing this in his own way in many ways. And he makes the point that, like, you know, sending robots is great, but the promise of Apollo is humans going to places, right? There's, there are some special reasons, uh, you know, and a bunch of other luminaries, um, uh, Hawkins, I've seen Hawkins and others have, have said some of the things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one other quote from that exact same, this, this was the name of the book, by the way, Spaceship One, who came out in 2007. Another thing he said in that same foreword uh, was, interesting, uh, we, not, we need not rely solely on governments for expanding humanity's presence beyond, beyond Earth. In that sense, space travels are turning to where it started, with maverick pioneers dreaming of journeys to orbit and beyond. I love that. And lastly, my favorite quote by far from Andrew Chaikin's Man on the Moon. This is his, uh, the final page. Uh, and I'll read it aloud just because I think it, it again gives me chills every time. Once we're living on the moon and venturing out across the solar system, the fact that we waited so long to resume our explorations will hardly matter. Historians of the far future may look back on Apollo and the missions that are yet to come as one great age of space exploration. But in my mind's eye, it's a slow dissolve from memory to anticipation, from what has been to what will be from dream to dream. Yep, I, got, <laughs> I had chills <laughs> um, all up and down my spine every single time that one gets me. So let me um, let me end with that and say thank you. Uh, um, this, oh yeah, there's a little photo of Dragon at station uh, from the DM2 mission. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention this. I should have showed a photo. I have the hatch. I can't see it here. It's a, it's a, at the bottom. Uh, it has the SpaceX logo on it uh, that pops off when the drogue chutes comes out and landed in the Gulf of Mexico and a fisherman retrieved it. I managed to obtain it from that fisherman. So I have here in the office around the corner, the actual SpaceX logo hatch from the first human flight, which has got to be the coolest thing ever. So let me end show. And I, I apologize that I haven't seen, oh, cool. Oh, there's some amazing people here. Uh, wow, there's a lot of people here. Um, thank you for some of these comments. And we have some questions. Perfect. So I will, <laughs> comments can slap you on. I got to, first I got to look at some of these, these um, things that I've missed. Uh, oh, this is awesome. Okay, so let me go to, I do love this though. Uh, I hope this will stay. I hope I can go back later and read all your, your chat, which I intend to do. So I'm going to go to Q&A. If it will let me. Yeah, here we go. Okay, let me, I'm going to skim them real quick. Uh, yeah, some of these might be, Longer than others. So, um, Joyce, on the B612 comets, now I don't know, but my quick thought is that we probably have a good enough read on the comets that we can see. Um, but maybe, I don't know if there's some, I don't know if there's a, here's what I don't know. This is ignorance on my part. I, what I don't know is if a comet is small enough not to live a, leave a visible trail, it, it doesn't matter, right? Because they're, mo they're, they're more snow than they are like the iron nickel meteorites, which are real ball busters, if you will. Um, so kind of like a snowball in space. I don't know, but I'm wondering if it's the case that the ones we see are the big ones and we can model those plenty well off of what we have. What, the tougher thing, the much tougher thing, let me, are the, are the um, asteroids in the Earth orbit because think of them as lumps of coal in terms of the color gamut. Uh, and they get warm like the comets when they go around the sun and it's that IR radiation that you look for. So the, the satellites, by the way, that are looking for the near Earth asteroids are looking in the IR band. They use these cryogenically cooled sensors, uh, at least they used to, they're, they're, they're now realizing they can use cheaper sensors and deal with the noise through software, which is great, because believe me, when you go to Raytheon and ask for these IR cooled sensors, boy, it's like half the cost of the mission is that, that sensor. Um, that 400 million I was mentioning, uh, which, oh, by the way, I forgot to make the analogy. Uh, the new wing 
you know, the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco costs four hundred dollars. And so I, as a donor, I'm like, well, shoot, I'd rather protect all the artifacts um, than just that one building. But that's kind of cheeky. Um, so my quick answer is I think comets aren't as much of a problem and that we can use terrestrial observation, but I have never asked B612, so I'd be guessing. Okay, uh, ooh, China. Uh, hmm. Well, let me, okay, so I don't have, a, I, don't have, I don't have any proprietary data feed on China worth sharing, meaning I see, well, that's not true. I've, I've, I've had a few Chinese small sat, excuse me, a launch vehicle companies like Linkspace and others uh, present, and they are, doing good work on vertical takeoff and landing. It, it seemed a couple of years ago, they were just going like gangbusters and, and really making rapid progress, but they've gone totally radio silent over the last year or two, actually last year or so. Oh, um, I don't know what's going on there. There's a bunch of others that, uh, there's a handful of companies in China, that, that, at least on the entrepreneurial side, that are really just slapping together off the shelf stuff and not pushing the envelope in any meaningful way and, and, and failing in launch and, and probably aren't gonna go anywhere. But the big China, China writ large, the government is uh, taking it seriously, right? They're going to, they're doing amazing things on the far side of the moon. They're putting orbiters up. They're going to, you know, they're going to want to claim the mantle uh, just in the same way the U.S. did versus Russia, right? In, in the Cold War of supremacy, uh, whatever it might be, Mars, moon, both. And, you know, they're, they're going to have a station soon in orbit. Um, there's a lot going on there. And I don't know if, if and when the U.S. feels competitive responsiveness to that, meaning like wanting to be first again in certain things. Um, I kind of hope they do because the more competition you have, the more rapid you move, uh, the more things that will take place and it provides a motivation if anyone was lacking one for galvanizing the country behind a big, bold, you know, moonshot in, in quote marks. I mean, if you think about the shuttle era and others, um, especially SLS, where it's like, what's it, what's it for? Um, you need a goal, right? You need something that motivates people. You need the moonshot. You need leadership to tell us what we want to do. Like somebody, could be NASA, could be private sector, could be China setting the agenda. Um, so are they gaining on us? No doubt, but have they passed us? No, uh, I don't think so. But boy, they're doing amazing stuff. They're, let's just put it this way. They're the only entity on earth that's doing serious work uh, worth watching other than SpaceX. Um, now, eh, maybe I should include one other company, but let's just say that has launched something here. There we go. There's my qualifier. So if you consider groups that have put something into orbit, some of you will know what I'm referring to in that qualification. So people we should take seriously of those, China is the one to watch. Uh, there really isn't anyone else that's doing anything. I mean, like take Europe. Like, wow, they need to rejigger everything. The Ariane 6 is just not interesting. Like reusability, pushing envelope, like doing something that's not ten-year-old catch-up. Um, you don't see it anywhere but China. Um, okay, that maybe is saying more than I should. Uh, when will he? Oh, Joe. Wait. Oh my God, there's a ton of questions. Oh my God, Lord, I thought there were just four. Okay, where am I gonna? How am I gonna prioritize this? Hmm. Okay, I'm just gonna go through these from the top down, uh, and I don't know if the, how these are sorted. Uh, have model rockets passed? The Kármán line, oh, absolutely, 100 kilometer, uh, many times. So you could look up um, Go Fast One by My uh, Michelson. I think that might be one of the highest, like 300,000. Uh, I, I personally witnessed Quake go over 100,000 and a few others, Rocket Mavericks. That thing I showed was meant to go way over 100,000. And by the way, when you see screenshots from these folks, they're often at that 100 kilometer mark, but look at the velocity vector. It's still quite high and positive, just, just saying. Um, so they've gone quite a bit higher than that. Um, how can the average person invest in new space? Um, good question. <laughs> okay, don't invest in Virgin Galactic. Sorry, uh, it's like my game, GameStop, you know, public service announcement. Um, <laughs> there, there's not much. Um, there's gonna be a whole bunch of SPACs coming out in the next month or two for small site launch companies, not a bunch, like, like two or three. Um, if they all succeed, they're all in process. Uh, Shoot, I don't have anything to recommend. Um, sadly, uh, SpaceX is hard to invest in. There's you know, a lot of groups, large institutional groups. It's not publicly available, so it's not possible. Planet Labs is not possible quite yet. I mean, they're both private, so not possible. Um, I don't have anything to recommend. Uh, and, and, and strong warnings uh, for everything else out there. So just wait, wait a few years. Uh, assume, oh God, there's so many coming in here. 
Oh, bottom questions of the olds. Okay. Um, fair enough. Thank you. I'll start at the bottom then, just to be fair. Mars versus space habitats. Oh, who can, thank you. Interesting question. Um, I think this is fascinating. So by space habitats, I'm assuming you mean things like, you know, the high frontier, uh, analysis of, you know, rotating stations or, you know, dedicated structures in space. So at a high level, I, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer. I think both sounds interesting, right? So how about that? So here's an advantage. So rotating stations, you can have uh, one gravity, one, you know, one earth gravity pretty easily, especially if they're large, you won't get the, the sort of weird uh, uh, ear effects of, of rotating a small thing at speed. So a large ring, let's say, just like in 2001, a space odyssey, uh, strangely, you know, exactly like that. Uh, the advantage is we know human reproduction can work in one gravity. We don't know that in Mars gravity or moon gravity. Um, it's never been tested. Uh, one of my personal pet projects, I would love the small sat launch community, like talk about something you probably do for less than $10 million all in, is uh, what I call rats in space. A, rotary, a rotating disc, and rats are smaller, so maybe they won't freak out if it's only, you know, whatever the width of a fairing is for, for launch. So some rotating disc where you have different habitats and you have rats at all different stages of gestation, right? So you, you have to like, have one of these places where you can like play with your payload right before launch. So you have different levels of gestation and then some rats that haven't reproduced yet, but they're in like, you know, the, the sort of the orgy den. And you simply have cameras to see if a live birth occurred. You don't have any of the other instruments and craziness and things you would l ultimately like to answer if you don't have a live birth, like what the hell went wrong? It'd be nice to have a quick and dirty test. Can reproduction occur? Oh, and the reason in a ring, so you can spin it up at Martian gravity or, or moon gravity. Um, there have been attempts. Pet, PETA shut down one of them. Um, the ISS has a centrifuge, but it rotates the ISS too much, so they don't use it. So there's just had, this has never been done. There have been proposals. They haven't flown. I suspect because of you know animal rights protests, this might need to fly outside the U.S. Um, but like someone should do that. But let's answer that question early before we like go all in for a permanent moon base where human reproduction might not be possible. Uh, hopefully it would be on the Mars. Okay, uh, oh, sorry. So rotating, the, the negative of rotating is like you gotta put all the crap in space. Like you have all the launch costs and assembly costs to build something that you, where are you getting it from? Are you getting it from Earth? Well, just stay on Earth then. But you wanna be in space. Okay, how about Mars? Like it's just a lot easier to do in situ resource utilization on moon or Mars to build stuff habitats, more things, you know, just better. And if you take the, let's make humanity multiplanetary species, it's hard if you don't have a planetary base to keep a structure in space going in perpetuity, right? You, you kind of need some planet to go back to or to extract resources from um, in the long run, right? Because you're like, if in the void of space, like you only got what you got, right? You're depending on something, maybe asteroid mining, but some parent body to source material from. Uh, hence, I think that's farther out than just going to Mars. I was like, why not do that first? Mars seems so much easier, in my opinion. Um, but again, my, my answer was do both. Okay. Uh, oh, interesting. Did this just change? That that question disappeared. Oh, no. Weird. Where do you see the future model rocketry heading? Hmm. Matt, interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't have a good answer there because I haven't been tracking that. And, you know, I do love the work that Aerotech is doing on long burning motors, new, all kinds of different propulsive systems, single use motors. I got to tell you, right, having done a lot of O-ring work, the barrier to entry for someone to do high power rocketry comes out a lot with single use motors. Um, a huge fan. Uh, also 3D printing. I love, I mean, I've done probably 40 launches of 3D printed fin cam that I designed. It's on, um, uh, what the hell, Thingiverse uh, free for anyone, 29 millimeter and a 38 millimeter. I think I put a 50, yeah, a 54 millimeter. It should be up there. I've done a four inch uh, air Again, this sort of MakerBot cheap PLA thin cans, as, as by the way, like thin alignment works perfectly when you 3D print them. Um, and they go supersonic. I've taken on the Mach 2, uh, no thin flutter. Uh, it's a simple sandwich, right, with a honeycomb the way you imagine, but printed. Uh, again, PLA plastic, uh, really amazing stuff. Um, that, so personally, I've been more kind of like planet with disposable rocketry. Um, uh, disposal satellites, the idea of disposal rocketry things that I wouldn't mind if a fin broke because it's a dollar ninety two of materials and energy cost to print a new one, and I get a new one overnight, so I just slide it off, put a new fin can on. Um, you know, no longer worrying about fin alignment, fin attachment, fill I, I, I yeah, print the fillets, I print the launch lugs, everything is in the same print. Okay, anyway, I'm not sure. So I'm going to move on because I don't have a great answer that I feel is inspirational to your question. Sorry. What prevents uh, foreign non-friendly governments from taking out Starlink satellites? Oh, very cool question. 
I mean, I've never heard that one before. I mean, I've never thought about that before, but, uh, is there agreement between countries outside to fly over? Oh, right. So there is an agreement. The, the, the Space Act allows us to fly over any country we want. Um, now, different question is, can you connect? So obviously take China, for example, you're not going to like just give free access to internet to the people or, you know, North Korea, even more so. Let's, maybe North Korea is a less confrontational example. Um, dropping Starlinks in North Korea, I think would be a really cool, uh, humanitarian thing. You know, plug it in and let them have access to Radio Free Europe, if you will. Um, but normally, if you're not hostile, you need uh, basically rights to broadcast into a country. It's not clear that there's any limit on broadcast out. Uh, and there's some designs people, other groups are working on for direct cell phone connections to space uh, where you might imagine texting out, uh, if, you know, bypassing repression, regi repressive regimes, um, which would be fascinating. Um, but back to your question on Starlink. So, so first off, Starlink can, they can fly over any country. Totally different question in negotiating with local uh, governments is, you know, landing rights and, and what have you. Um, and that's happening as we speak all around, around uh, the world. Okay. Uh, why? Wait, I try to scroll. Oh, maybe there's so many questions. Oh my gosh. That, um, that I don't see the old ones anymore. I apologize. So I'm, I'm trying to go to the bottom ones, but now it's somewhat random. Okay. Now the federal government has removed imaging limitations and the National Authorization Act. Uh, is planet providing access to blanked out areas? I don't know for sure. Um, like President Trump in China, I believe, but we can go check because you can go on their site and check anywhere you want, right? You can like look at your home, you can look at a region. I believe they're doing everything. Like I don't think they're holding back on anything. So, um, now, oh, uh, as a U.S. company, I'm not sure if there's some U.S. military assets. That, that would be an interesting one. I don't think they're holding back on like North Korea though, for example, um, or places like that. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, but we can easily find out. Let's go. Uh, oh, let me hit. Uh, let me hit, if I hit a dismiss question, maybe they'll give me room for the other ones. Okay. What would you say is the best justification for settlements on the moon? Ah, great question. So inspiration, uh, reviving the human interest in the space programs in general, and for young people to study math and science. Uh, you know, the number of PhDs in engineering went up through the roof after Sputnik. And as we entered the space race and then it dropped off during the shuttle era dramatically, it's kind of like you know, almost perfect correlation. So the fact that more people would study things and be inspired to do software engineering, let's say, and things that could support these programs is frankly the biggest and best reason. Second one that I think is right on maybe a tie um, is, uh, you, know, you know, proving grounds for things you're going to want to do on Mars. So getting the moon is quicker, uh, data links, uh, well, no, not data links, matter. Just, just getting back and forth, cheaper and easier and quicker. So your iteration cycle on does it, you know, how is this habitat with micrometeorite protection? How is it with radiation? How is it with whatever you might want to test if you're designing as just as an example, a habitat or a greenhouse? You know, if something works on the moon, it'll probably work on Mars because you have more uh, shielding, a little bit of an atmosphere. You know, they got, you got some protection, especially from micrometeorites. Uh, for example, uh, so that if it works great on the moon, it should probably work fine on Mars, uh, I think. Not obvious why, that, why that's not a true statement. Um, they might be over-engineered, right? It might be more expensive uh, than you need for Mars, but, but at least it's an interesting place to test, not to mention all kinds of other things like human psychology uh, in, in the early days, governance in the early days, a very interesting set of questions on how decisions will be made. Um, I think... And obviously, you know, growing food uh, and things of this sort. Um, yeah, just about everything. Uh, the the in situ resource utilization, you know, maybe some similarities. The, the lunar regolith and the Martian regolith are different, but simple things like can we, you know, bulldoze a bunch of you know, gravel and and stuff in, with some epoxy binder and make domes over inflatable structures. They, some ESA studies and others have shown, um, you know, why not try that on the moon first? You we get data sooner as we're building up for the Martian mission. At least that's my first thought. Okay. Why did NASA never come back to the Delta Clipper program? Don't know. Sorry. Um, Joe, what is your personal prediction on which years? Oh, yeah. yeah humans return to the, to the moon's surface. You know, you know, if you could decouple it from funding, right? So it's tempting to wait for, like, the uh, Artemis program. Like, they, they're going to fund things, right? There was a time not too long ago when, you know, 2024 was a target date. Um, you would, you would kind of assume that's how we'd get there, at least in the U.S., if that's happening. And so the question is, is that happening? Is that morphing? Is that pushed out? You know, uh, but there's no reason it couldn't happen by 2024 or 2025. It just mean like, okay, we're doing it with SpaceX and <laughs> it's 
it's pretty obvious um, that we could do that. Uh, and so the question is harder for me to answer uh, because there's a funding question um, on, on how, we, how we get there um, that I can't predict. Assume adequate funding. How long would it take to establish a permanent? I don't know. Uh, how long would it take to permanent lunar settlement? It shouldn't be long. I mean, within a year, easily. Um, what's your opinion on Breakthrough Listen <laughs> and Starshot? You know, so I'm not less familiar with Listen, but Starshot's amazing. Like, wow, there, there is a huge list of major technology hurdles they need to knock down to make that work. This is a, a swarm of tiny satellites propelled by laser to a neighboring solar system. And that probably will work. The real open question is how they get any data back of interest, you know, an image, uh, a data stream of some sort to, to show. You know, the, the whole point of going there is to, to beam something back um, that we can use uh, as information here. So um, all I know is I love that Yuri Milner has funded this, that he's unafraid to ask the bold question, can we do this, and try to get it done. I mean, like, that's humanity at its best. And um, kind of crazy also that, you know, a single philanthropist is doing it, not a government. And uh, you think about space exploration and the front, you know, the final frontier. And uh, you know, maybe the, maybe NASA or others concluded it's just too crazy. But we love crazy as venture capitalists. And oh, by the way, you know, Pete Warden, who I mentioned earlier, the guy who ran NASA Ames, he's you know running that program with Yuri Milner. So big fan of that um, personally. Uh, what is the? Oh no, I answered that question. Sorry. Okay, let me go up here. Um, what is your take on the benefits of return on investment between Mars and Moon station prioritization? Oh, well, well, that's interesting. Return on investment. That's a tough one. Very different time frames. I think Mars, okay, so first off, Moon is a great tourist destination. So when you think about tourism, let me start with tourism as just an issue. Thought experiment. I would Mars. Mars, this sort of 26 month alignment of the planets it means you either go in a slingshot, you know, kind of flight, or you go there really stay for a short time and come right back. Large travel overhead for a short stay, much more likely with window. So that's more of a settler, or maybe the kind of vacation a European would take, but not a Californian. Uh, it's you know, 26 month vacation. Um, so more settlement vacation, and similarly, the ROI might be a much lo more longer sort of civilization colonization kind of play. Um, I think at one point Elon joked, you know, what's, what was the value of discovering North America? You know, well, interestingly, by the way, Isabella funded Col Christopher Columbus in what might be argued as the first sort of venture capital like investment model of, you know, I want a percent of your company and your profits. It's it kind of fascinating. Uh, you could argue that it actually was a venture back model, but Col Christopher himself did not quite capitalize on the economic might of North America. Um, and therein lies the big question how does one earn? A return on making humanity a multiplanetary species. So let's just say longer term. Moon, near term, well, actually, Moon and Mars both. <laughs> Here's a funny thing. One of the, the, the more obvious near term and lucrative business models for the Moon, when we did that thought experiment back in 2014, is reality television. I hate to say it, but it is no doubt that could fully fund the program. Um, and then I jokingly think about the Hunger Game variant where the food supplies drop a certain distance from the base, but then no one, no one liked my idea. And, and upping the, uh, the sort of excitement quotient. Uh, you could do the same. Yeah. Uh, moon being close to Earth has offers some unique opportunities that Mars is a little bit less obvious. Like, you can put a, because of the tidal lock on Earth, you can put a rail gun is the answer, but certainly stuff into low Earth orbit that you could then use for low Earth orbit economy if it exists. So this has been a challenge. There's not a business sending things in the so like sending water, sending fuel. Uh, we don't currently have anything that would make use of that. But but there's a little bit of a chicken and egg of will a thriving economy that's assuming abundant water and regolith or whatever the hell you'd send from from the moon um, 
you know, to, into a lower orbit, you know, to take use of that. So uh, let me let me move on to something else. It's moving. Uh, could big model rockets with thrust vector control launch a single CubeSat to low Earth orbit? Hmm. Probably not in the way we're defining model rockets. Like, like one of the smaller ones is Astra, uh, which is here in the East Bay, um, launching out of Kodiak. And you can get a sense of scale when you look at the rockets. They're not that big, but they're pretty big. And liquid fuel and two stage. So like no one solves the single stage to orbit. So you're definitely two stage. And I'm not sure it'll pencil out with solids. It might. Uh, hybrid has been tough. Um, people have tried. But I guess there's a fine. Here's a question. Where, you know, where do you draw the line between a hobbyist and a business? And it, you know, when you're talking about several tens of millions of dollars, it may not be what we call, you know, the NAR hobby rocket community. That's more probably a small business. Okay. Um, boy, there's a lot of cool questions here. Okay. How, oh, how are satellite satellites being modified to prevent lighting up the night sky? I would point there's uh, on the Starlink page, Starlink.com. There's a place. You can get to, or maybe it's on the SpaceX page, that shows these nightshades and other things. Um, realize, just for a moment, dawn and dusk is when they're lit up. Uh, most of the serious astro astronomy occurs later in the night, when this is not an issue as much. Uh, there'll be a thermal signature, but not a, not a reflection. Um, and so it's not as bad as it may seem at first. Um, it, it's really hitting the amateurs, I mean, not the amateurs, the, the, the hobbyists and others who want to you know, do it at a convenient time and not in the middle of the night. Uh, to look up at the night sky and capturing a lot of these images that light up um, when, when it's being lit up. I'll look at the next question. How would you compare SpaceX's design development process to governments? Uh, okay. Do you attribute the difference mostly to the adoption of commercially available technology? At what point does SpaceX, quote, lock down design before going to development? Well, <laughs> that last part is an interesting question. In a sense, they don't lock down the design and go to development on Starship. Think about the SN8. Uh, which is pretty amazing. And then, you know, nine and 10, which are ready to fly. There's a lot of design iteration going on between each of those, right? So they learn of an issue in the, you know, upper, you know, alleged tank on the first flight. They change that very easily and quickly for the second. Um, so it's a uh, iterative design development cycle around a certain space, but there's a lot of moving parts still, right? As, as you know, if you just look historically uh, in that, in the way Starship was done. If you think of Falcon 9, um, the design of Falcon 9 waited for Falcon 1, I mean, parts of it waited for Falcon 1's success to show, yeah, the engine does perform exactly the way it should, and now we've used nine of them. And so there was a little more of a, it worked the first time, when Falcon 9 flew, you know, well the first time. Um, so, so I guess what I'm saying is they're moving more to a fluid, continuous, sort of agile aerospace thing, kind of like what Planet is doing with satellites. Uh, coming up to your prior question, do I attribute the difference in government and SpaceX mainly to commercially available? No, a big part is using commercially available technology, but the government could do that too. Um, I think that's a big part. The main thing is a, taking a software slash Silicon Valley approach to design and engineering. Um, hiring the best and the brightest, moving quickly, um, doing it all within one company is a big difference as well. So, you know, Shuttle and SLS both have just this huge array of suppliers. So compatibility issues, the ability to do sort of this insightful optimization across the entire stack disappears if it's a highly fractured stack. So that example I gave of spinning the rocket to de deploy the satellites, with, you'd want to have control over upper stage propulsion as well as satellite design to even think of doing something like that. Um, yeah. And Chip, the main answer to your question is cost plus. If you have a cost plus contract, you should. Right. This has been the history of much of the US space program where, you know, you have this perverse incentive to cost more because you'll get paid more. It's cost plus a premium. And if you take longer, there's no penalty. It's like it's crazy. Whereas if you have competitive bidding and the cost like like commercial space programs, you bid, you have a couple of companies competing with each other to win a piece of business at a fixed price. That's the best. Right. That's where the government procurement works the best and commercial programs thrive. Um, Let's see, I'll take one more question because, um, because we're, running, we're at the end of the thing. I love the fast development of SpaceX, something different every day. What talent? Just wondering if that talent could be used to develop technology to provide clean water for millions here on Earth. A huge problem. Great question. Um, well, in theory, yes. Um, there's, a, I think, a bit of a false premise that, that, let's say, a space company should be focusing on Earth. 
as if there aren't other companies that we should be focusing on Earth. So for example, water purification is a huge need. I would say it's one of the biggest disconnects between market need and entrepreneurial activity, meaning there's just not enough entrepreneurial activity. We've been looking for decades for something that's different from reverse osmosis or distillation, these basic technologies that have been around forever. We did invest in one that did forward osmosis, um, a company called Oasis. It ended up failing in the end, but man, I loved it because they actually had a really clever, brand new way of doing water purification. And, and it may come back in a different form. I think it should. It, it uses ammonia salts and, and uses osmosis as your friend, not your enemy. Anyway, um, so I think people should solve water purification. We at Future Ventures would love to invest in that. To redirect at this time, SpaceX engineers who are fully engaged and like really busy with a lot of things on that may not be the best use of their skills. Eventually, that needs like space is the ultimate recycling challenge. Water, everything, energy, food, waste products, you know, especially at station. And, and then if you were doing a rotating, you know, habitat in space, not on a, on a surface, you, you really need to reuse everything. And um, in some ways, that design challenge could galvanize activity to solve it that then could be, you know, of course, useful on Earth. So the best water purification, the best greenhouses, um, the best nuclear energy, compact nuclear reactors. I mean, there's an obvious one. Like I was finding some advisors to the federal government on this and I was like, wow, if you guys could just say, look, putting a nuclear reactor on the moon will be, you know, say regulated completely differently. We'll actually let you take, you know, some risks, we'll let you try new things um, and we'll buy them at this fixed price. Wouldn't that be amazing to get nuclear reactor design done with that initial target in mind, but then roll it out across the United States um, and, and the world rather, um, and China in particular, uh, as an example, right? So energy generation, compact uh, fission and fusion, both. Um, so let me end with that to say, I think a lot of spin-off technologies in what we would call clean tech or green tech are inevitable. Um, sell it or meat, for example, you're not gonna have cows and goats on Mars, right? You're gonna grow meat the way Memphis Meats is doing it in a, you know, perfectly good steaks and everything else, but you're not gonna kill animals. That's gonna save Earth too. It has to be done that way. Um, it has to be done that way on Earth and in space um, and so forth. So like there's like a whole bunch of areas, water was the question, but like, you know, food manufacturing writ large, um, everything recycling, uh, everything um, energy efficient, like to the extreme, um, and then energy generation and storage. Those all like you got to do it as well as you possibly could to make these designs pencil out where every kilogram costs money that's delivered to a distant place, and um, and hence it's you know the final frontier coming back to improve life on Earth. So let me say thank you everyone here. Um, I apologize, but I got to run, and um, hopefully I'll be able to uh, see this again and look through the material later. Uh, after I go back and get some dinner. So thanks everyone, and uh, thanks for stopping in. Bye. Oh, and if you want to contact me, you can see it. I think you can see it there on the screen. Uh, uh, Steve at Future Ventures is my email. It comes right to me, or on Twitter at Future Jurvetson. All right, everyone. Bye.